Great to be with you this evening. Um, let's turn to John 17. And um, we're in the middle of the second section of our study. So year two, and we're looking at John 12, chapters 12 through the end of the gospel this year. And you'll remember that the, the gospel of John is basically divided into two big sections, the book of signs, which are summarized in seven signs John highlights that he chooses from all that Jesus did meant to reveal His glory, to reveal His identity. And so those seven signs culminate in the resuscitation, the resurrection of Lazarus. And all of the signs point to the identity of Jesus and the mission of Jesus, ultimately is Jesus' own death and resurrection. So they're pointing that direction. And so Lazarus' uh, resurrection is a pivot point in the gospel and moves us then into the final week. So the whole second half of John's gospel is dealing primarily with just this one week, especially chapters uh, 13 through, or chapter 12 through chapter 20. So it's really a one-week time frame. And the vast majority of that is dealing with one evening and a lengthy discourse that Jesus has with His disciples, a final word that Jesus has with His own. So after teaching them, so you'll remember now He's washed their feet, they're at this meal together, and He gives them instruction. He tells them about the coming work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then, at the end of this lengthy discourse, at the end of this meal, He does something uh, for His disciples in the text, which in ancient literature was completely expected. He prays. So, in John 17 is recorded for us not a prayer Jesus gives us to pray, but a prayer He prays on our behalf. So we, we want to begin to look at that this evening. And I, I think this night and next Wednesday night are the final studies in December. So then we have a lengthy break. And there is no final exam or anything like that next Wednesday, though I thought about it. I thought that would be a fine idea. So, name the seven signs, you know, or something like that. But um, we'll skip that. So, we're going to try to cover as much as we can of John 17 tonight and next Wednesday. And if we don't get through all of it, that's fine. We'll pick it up in January and press ahead. But we'll do as much as we can, and we want to um, have a good close look at what happens here. Now, one of the things that we wanted to note in the overall structure of the way John's put together, remember, it's not written in chapter and verse. Chapters and verses are notations which are added centuries later to help us find things in the Bible. Uh, John wasn't writing that way. But there are underlining, underlying uh, visual elements and literary elements, and one of the visual theological pictures that John uses to structure his gospel. You'll remember this, and this was this goes. Some of you who are here a year ago will remember this. We won't go into detail tonight, but the gospel is structured after the tabernacle of Moses in the temple uh, of Solomon as well. So it begins outer court and moves to inner court. It goes through the table of showbread and the lampstand, having to do with light. And then, when you get into the holy place, uh, you have you have as you enter the holy place, you have. Uh, three particular pieces of furniture. You have the um, table of showbread. You have the uh, menorah, the, the, uh, uh, the gold lampstand. And then you have this, this uh, third article, which is an altar. But it's a small altar. And what's burned on that altar? Incense. And there the priest would go into that part of the tabernacle or the temple twice daily, morning and evening, to burn incense. And so you find references to that all over the Bible. So for instance, the psalmist says, let my prayer to you be as incense, and the lifting up of my hands is the evening offering. So this is the place where the priest daily is interceding for the people. So in the structuring of John's gospel, the sort of literary underpinnings of the text, 
you are now standing at the place in the tabernacle structure of the altar of incense where Jesus, acting as a high priest, is going to pray for his disciples. Now, from a cultural standpoint, coincidentally, uh, this is from a literary cultural standpoint, anybody in the Gentile world looking at this document would have expected at the end of a, di a farewell discourse a prayer to the deity, whatever deity someone was dealing with, on behalf of the people that he's giving the farewell discourse to. So this would be very typical. So we have an interesting intersection here from a literary standpoint, from a sort of Gentile, just out in the world literary standpoint. They were used to the fact that there's a farewell discourse, and at the end of the farewell discourse, a prayer to the deity on behalf of the people uh, um, uh, that, that the dying man is entrusting his mission and his teaching to. So that's what they would have expected. From a theological standpoint, Hebrew background, Jewish background, they would have been going through the stages of John's gospel and going, you know what's next? You know what's next? The altar of incense is next. And that's all about prayer and intercession and priestly ministry. And so we come to what's called Jesus' high priestly prayer. And the artwork that's on your, your study guide this evening is um, from... Uh, catacombs in Rome. This shows an ancient Christian at prayer, and this is called the Oran's position. We tend to we tend to pray. Usually, if somebody if somebody says today in our culture, let's pray. What does everybody do? Yeah, they bow our heads like this. That comes out of the feudal period. That comes out of the medieval period. All right, where if you if you spoke to a lord, what would you do? You would, you would bow, all right? So it's a, it's a form, it's a, and we're just used to that in our culture. So we bow our heads, we would fold our hands. These are, these are really um, ways of praying physically that are associated with Western culture that grew up in the, middle, in the, in the medieval period that come out of the uh, feudal covenantal structure of society. The biblical positions on prayer are very, very different. When Paul writes to Timothy, for instance, he says, I want men to pray everywhere doing what? Anybody remember what the rest of the text says? Lifting up holy hands. And, 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 and so, you know, you read texts about worship. The very word worship means to bow down. So worship, prayer, all of these things have a very physical dimension to them, not just an intellectual dimension or a volitional dimension or an emotional dimension, a physical dimension to them. And when you see ancient Christians at prayer, they're always, they're always portrayed in this way. They're, they have their hands lifted up like this. So if you see a, a biblical art showing somebody like this and they're praying like this, that's from the Middle Ages. Okay? But you, if you go way, way back, all right, you go back to uh, ancient kind of Roman graffiti, if you will, and see here's how people prayed. This is how they prayed, like this. So that's the Oran's position. It's from the Latin ora, which means prayer or pray. And um, so uh, the Benedictine model, ora et labora, pray and work. That's the uh, Benedictines. So ora et labora. So this is the Oran's position. Hands lifted up. And what's, what's, which direction is the face going in your artwork here? That's up. So I will... I will uh, lift up my eyes. So instead of a head ba bowed down and eyes closed, the head's what? Up and the eyes are up. And instead of the hands folded, the hands are up like this. So it's a very different kind of position. So, when you th so the reason I'm bringing that to you tonight is because when you think of Jesus praying for his disciples, I, I don't want you to think of Jesus like this. I want you to think of the disciples and they're at this meal and then Jesus has got the disciples around him and he's like this. Almost like the, the, a minister at the end of a service giving a benediction, right? I want you to think of Jesus with all the disciples around him, and he's like this, standing there, and they're standing with him, and, and he's, he's crying out to the Father, right? So just, just, just some imagery, just to kind of give you a, a picture of what's going on there. So in John 17, um, and it's a fair division in terms of the chapter here, uh, what, what happens is Jesus finishes the discourse, and he moves then into this priestly ministry of prayer. All right, what happens? Jesus here is not portrayed as being in agony, as in Gethsemane. Uh, the burden of John's gospel is to show Jesus 
full and true deity, not to the exclusion of His true humanity or to its eclipse in any way or its denial in any way. It's not Gnostic in any way. But the emphasis in John's gospel is on Jesus' deity. In the, how does he begin his gospel? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the way in which John treats the conception and the birth of Jesus is not with a, a narrative about Mary or Joseph or Gabriel or wise men or shepherds. He comes at it from a heavenly perspective, from before time begins, in the beginning. And he begins it with the procession of the Son from the Father. Mary is on the scene in John chapter 2 at the wedding of Cana. So we know that she's involved in this word becoming flesh. There's no denial of the humanity. But the emphasis that John has is on Jesus' deity. His absolute, his absolute authority, his absolute power in all situations. So the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that word synoptic means to see together. Those gospels are very, very concerned with showing Jesus' humanity in his approach amongst different peoples. And so in those Gospels, when we find Jesus at prayer, we find Him in agony. But here in John's Gospel, this is not Gethsemane. He is not in agony. This is Jesus in ecstasy, not agony. And He is in deep, profound communion with the Father. And He is interceding on behalf of these men the Father has given to Him, and by them interceding for the whole world. So, no denial of Jesus in Gethsemane, and we can all identify with that, but let's not forget Jesus in ecstasy. Jesus in deep and profound a communion with the Father here. And there are some words that are used here that are very, very important for us. Um, it is also, um, from a literary standpoint, it has an inclusio, which is to say it has bookends, this prayer. And the key um, is part of the title of our whole course, Behold the Glory. So, glory is a very important word in the whole, whole prayer. It begins it and it ends it. Jesus spoke these things and lifting up His eyes to heaven. See, there's that lifting up language, that Oran's position. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son that the Son may glorify You. And then later in verse 24, you get to the end of the prayer. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may, may be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which, I, which you have given me for you love me before the foundation of the world. So it begins with glory. It ends with glory. And glory, as you know, is a super, super important word in John's Gospel. It's just jam-packed with theological significance that has to do with Jesus' crucifixion, the revelation of who the Father is and His loving sacrifice. And it also has to do with Jesus' exaltation to the Father's right hand. To possess what He has always possessed as God the Son, but which has been veiled. How's the hymn go? Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity pleased as man with men to dwell jesus our emmanuel you i'm telling you this is the best time of the year theologically you get to sing some great theology all through advent and christmas it's just so rich and wonderful so so all of us who are studying john's gospel together should be even more profoundly aware of what we're singing in advent and in christmas so there's no eclipse of the humanity but this glory which is revealed is revealed in true, in true flesh. But it is glory which Jesus has possessed in eternity. And He is going back to it. And He wants the disciples to come and share in that glory as well. So the basic outline of it is pretty simple. In the first five verses, Jesus is making petitions about Himself. The first, so three sections here. Jesus' petition, petition about Himself, verses 1 to 5. And then in verses 6 through 19, Jesus petitions for the apostles. And by way of union, which he'll come to, it's also prayers for us. But the, the prayers for the apostles that are right there, right there with him on that night, the subject of verses 6 through 19, 
You and I are included in that prayer because we are united with Christ and we're united with the apostles. But he mentions us explicitly, so we're implicit in verses 6 through 19, but in verses 20 through 26, the, the implicit becomes explicit. And he's praying not just for the Christians in the room, the disciples in the room. He's praying across the centuries, through chronologies. And I wonder if we stop to ponder that for just a moment about the ministry of prayer. That prayer is one of those things that when we engage in it, we are transcending time. Some of you may have had the experience of looking at a a newborn baby. I know people who've done this, and, and, and thanks God for this newborn baby. I know people who've had a newborn child and begun to pray for their spouse. Isn't that interesting? You go, well, well, well don't be in such a hurry is part of the counsel you might give them, you know. But, but actually, you get the motive, don't you? Part of your prayer for your children is that they marry well. You know, you're praying, you're praying into the, you're praying for someone you don't know across a space of time. You don't know where they're at. You don't know who they are. You don't know if they've even been born yet. Well, prayer, you see, is one of those things that transcends space and time. So Christ prays 2,000 years ago, and His prayer is for you tonight. When you pray, you pray across centuries. And the fact that you are even here this evening is a result of the fact that Jesus interceded for you 2,000 years ago, and probably your grandmother did as well some of you are probably sitting here tonight because somebody lit a candle for you all right they were praying for you uh if you i don't know if you can find it on ancestry.com i'm not sure if a little leaf will pop up and say intercessor <laughs> something like that but we are we are many of us many of us well let me put it to you this way let me put it to you this way because it's so important if you go into a if i go into a congregation and i say uh well, I'll just do it here for you for tonight. This will be kind of fun. Just It's a small group. How many of you had Christian parents? Let me see your hands. Christian parents. Okay. How many of you did not have Christian parents? Okay. Okay. All right. That's, that's slightly what you're seeing there. We raised your hands and said, I didn't have Christian parents. That's the number I saw there, slightly higher than average. In almost every congregation in America, what's the vast majority of people, what are they made up of? People with what? Christian parents, all right? Suppose, suppose you went into a congregation and you said, it's a congregation of 2,000 people or 1,500 people or whatever. You said, hands up everybody here who had no Christian parents, right? How, and, 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 and they all raised their hands. What are you looking at? You're looking at a revival. You're looking at a whole new move of God. It's atypical. It's like God has swept into a place and seized a whole new generation for himself a whole new people for himself. You might be looking at a place that's in a country that has no previous history of the gospel. Because typically what happens is the gospel moves from one generation to the next because God moves by covenant succession. That's how God moves in history. That's why the, the baptism of our children and the discipling of our children is so important. We raise them in the faith. And so, so it's critical to understand that that's why all those genealogies are in the Bible, by the way. All those chapters you're, you're tempted to skip, Right? Oh, my gosh, reading all these names. Oh, but, but how many of you know that if your name was in there, you'd know where that was, right? You know, if it, ish, you know, if it you know, had all the L's and hit, you know, it's, and, and then it said Bob. You would go, that's me. You'd have that on your fridge. That would be framed. That would be framed up on the wall, right? That's, that's me right there. Okay, so, so we're part of this long story. So let me encourage you. You're praying tomorrow morning. You might be tired. You're only one cup of coffee into your prayers. You know, and I don't really pray until I'm at two. Okay, then I can really, really pray. Before that, just kind of meditating on my eyelids, really. That's all that's happening. So, I mean, God's there, but who, you, know, you don't really know it. And, and, and so you're, you're starting, but you might be kind of tired. You might feel like, oh, I'm just saying words. I don't know that I'm really accomplishing anything. Pray across the centuries. Pray across the nations. That's how Jesus prays. That's how he's interceding for you now. So that's critical. So that's the basic structure of the prayer. So prayers for himself, prayers for the apostles, prayers for the whole church. Let's talk a little bit about the fact that Jesus is praying. John 17, verse 1. 
Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, Abba, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Verse 4, I glorified you on the earth having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Incredible words. So here, let's stop and, and, and just pause here for a moment to consider the fact that Jesus is at prayer. We've just finished a long series on Sunday mornings on the Lord's Prayer, which began with this. The disciple come to Jesus and they see Jesus, having watched him pray, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And so he says, well, you don't need to use a lot of words. God's not impressed with that. He knows what you need before you ask. Use these words. And he gives them what we call the Lord's Prayer. And we know how that goes. It's why it's so vital in our lives every day and as a community of people. So it's how Jesus taught the church to pray. But it's important for us to know that our praying, listen to this, our praying is born out of Jesus praying. Our life in the Spirit is born out of His communion with the Father. The disciples see Him praying and they say, teach us to pray. So we become praying people because our Savior is Himself a man of prayer. He is deep in communion with the Father. So just a couple of things to remember, again, kind of going back over that Lord's Prayer series, just to remember from this. Um, first of all, we never pray alone. We never pray alone. What's the very first word of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father. And so Jesus gives the disciples this embrace. You are coming not just to my Father, but what? Our Father. So you, I'm not ashamed, the writer of Hebrews puts it this way, he's not ashamed to call us brethren. He brings us to God the Father, and God His Father becomes God our Father. We cry out by the Holy Spirit, Abba. Here's a second thing to realize. Here's a second thing to realize. Not only we do never pray alone because Jesus is always praying with us, but we're always praying in concert with the church. Even when you're sitting there at home and you're praying alone, you're never really alone. You're praying, and here's the ancient words from the uh, liturgy. Therefore, some of you may know these words. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven now i say those words every every time we we take communion together therefore with angels archangels and with all the company of heaven we praise and magnify your glorious day of evermore praising you and singing holy 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 is lord of hosts okay well who's who's included in all the company of heaven who's that saint all the saints we got we got we got martyrs and everybody who's gone before us who else? You know, we got angels, archangels, those beasts. I mean, you read the book of Revelation, there's some wild looking, you know, critters. Um, I'm, I'm just, I mean, there's, there's some, I, I don't know, you know, it's just kind of wild looking. Everybody's caught up in prayer. Uh, I know, I have a, a, a friend of mine, he's an orth, Orthodox priest, and he went to do a prayer service in the church, and uh, no one came. And a farmer saw him go in, and when he came out, the farmer was an unbeliever and said to him, how many were at the service today, Father, the Orthodox priest? And he said, knowing that no one had gone, and the priest said, untold millions. Because, of course, when we pray, we never pray alone. But with angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven. And that's why prayer in the New Testament is, is constantly in view as a community activity. It's something they're always doing together as a people. They're always praying together. So, so prayer is something that's communal. It's deeply personal as well as communal. It's always together. It's with the Father. It's together with Jesus. Our praying is born out of His praying. And, and, and it is His intercession for us which is highlighted in this text so Jesus here is acting as a priest. Now, I need you to look at two passages on that with me this evening. Just kind of run a couple of traps around this. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, and we're going to go from there to Hebrews chapter 7. So Romans 8, familiar words, but we could, we could miss something in this. 
then I don't want us to miss. So, in Romans 8, intercession, intercession is one of the highlighted aspects of uh, life in the Spirit. So, verse 26, Romans 8, 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps our weaknesses. We don't know how to pray as we should. Amen to that, right? We don't know. But the Spirit Himself, what? He intercedes. So, the first intercession is us. We are praying, but we don't know how to pray as we should. So, the Spirit intercedes. So, we're praying, and then we find that the Spirit is praying. He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, then, you come into Romans 8, 28. God causing all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Uh, Verses 29 and 30, verses that every good reformed believer knows. Those whom He foreknew, He predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. Those whom He predestined, He also called. Those whom He called, He also justified. Those whom He justified, He also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, Who can be against us? And so then Paul goes into this litany of all those things that can never separate us from the love of God. Why does he say this? So all of the theology that says you've been justified, you're being sanctified, you're going to be glorified. In fact, when Paul puts it down here in Romans 8, he counts it all as finished. He counts it all as done. It's it's in God's eye, it's all already done. Not only justification, but even your glorification is already done. And and that's how God views it. And that's why God is for you so no one can be against you. Why is it that no one can bring a charge against God's elect? Verse 33, well, it's God who justifies. Who is it that condemns? This is a rhetorical question Paul's asking. Of course, the answer is no one. But why? Why can't we be condemned? Christ Jesus is He who died. Okay, let's stop there. Christ Jesus is He who died. So, okay, I, uh, this is where most people stop with the gospel. I'm justified, I'm forgiven, I'm right with God because Jesus died. Yes, amen. I want to verify that. I will say amen to that. But that's not where Paul stops. Christ died, but then what does he say? And he was raised, and he's at the right hand of God, and he is interceding for us. Paul does not disconnect the death and resurrection of Jesus from the exaltation of Jesus, the enthronement of Jesus at the Father's right hand, and his continuing ministry of intercession. So Jesus has a ministry of life and death as a priest, but he has a continuing ministry as a priest of intercession at the Father's right hand. This never ends. In a certain sense, The disciples gathered there that night watching Jesus like this, lifting up, saying, Father, the glory that I had with you before the world began. Bring me back to that glory. Bring me back. They're watching it. What they were seeing happen is what Jesus was going to be doing for them for the next thousands and thousands of years until He returned. They got a preview of of the ministry He was moving into. So, so, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, and that's why, that's why Paul says, well, who will separate us from the love of Christ? And of course, what's the answer to that? And he goes through this whole list, but he says, I'm convinced that, in essence, skipping ahead, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why do you as, and I as believers have assurance tonight? Why do we have assurance? My assurance is rooted not in my experience as a believer, not in my emotions, not in my conduct in terms of my own performance. Though, though, if, I'm, if I behave sinfully, that can wound my conscience and trouble my assurance. The confession is very clear about that. But, but my assurance is not rooted in my performance. Where does assurance come from? Assurance. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says this, I have written these things to you who believe so that you may know 
that you are the children of God, that you may know. The word know shows up in 1 John 36 times. That you may know it, not hope it, not well maybe, but that you may what? These things I have written to you. It's My assurance is rooted in the election, the electing grace of God before all time. My assurance is rooted in the justifying death of Jesus Christ on the cross and His resurrection. And my assurance is rooted in Jesus' continuing intercession for me before the Father. Nothing can take me away from His love. Nothing can take me away from the Father's hand. Why? Because Christ is interceding for me. He will not let me go. That's, where my, that's why I have assurance tonight. This is the priestly ministry of Jesus. So the writer of Hebrews uh, gets into this as well. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews 7. Very similar passage from the writer of Hebrews talking about Jesus saving ministry, not simply in His death, And this, by the way, is in a larger section of Hebrews 7 on Jesus' priestly ministry, a priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek. So, um, verse 24, Jesus, on the other hand, by way of contrast with the Old Testament priests, because He continues forever, holds His priesthood permanently. Now, if I asked you tonight, how many hymns have you, are, are there about Jesus as Savior? You would say, well, lots. And Jesus is King. Lots. Redeemer, many. How many of you know lots of hymns about Jesus as your priest? Not so much. Now, I honestly don't know why that is. I don't know if it doesn't rhyme. Uh, it's a tough lyric to come up with. Honestly, I'm joking. I think the deal is this. I think... And, and how, many of you, how many of you have have any hymns about Jesus as a prophet? None. You can't think of a one, right? And yet the Bible's very clear that Jesus is not only king, but also prophet and priest. Prophet and priest. All right, so we need, we need to write some good, some of you need to write some good hymns. You guys, this is Music City, right? Let's get busy. All right, well, I'm, I'm commissioning you. Okay, so priesthood. He holds his priesthood permanently, so task of the priest is to intercede Therefore, he is able, this is verse 25, to save forever. How many of you have something other than forever in your text? The uttermost? What else? Completely. It's a very difficult place to translate. There's no one English word that translates it. I heard a good sermon one time, Rinda said, from the guttermost to the uttermost. That's, 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 that's how Jesus saves. So, so what it, the, the word completely is good which means that he, there is no aspect of your human person which is left untouched by grace. He saves you completely. He saves you forever, which means there is no span of time imaginable in which you can lose what He has brought to you. He not only saves you completely, He saves you how? Forever forever all right so it's a span of time and it's this the the aspect of totality completion why all of this is because jesus is your priest and he's interceding for you what does it mean for jesus to be your priest well the westminster confession of faith and larger catechisms and shorter catechisms speak to this in the um, Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 25, about Jesus being your priest. How does Christ execute the office of a priest? This is your shorter catechism. Christ executes the office of a priest. Listen to how the priesthood works in Jesus. In his once offering up of himself as a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice, and reconcile us to God, and in making continual intercession for us. So the Shorter Catechism says Jesus is a priest because He not only offers up the sacrifice and is the sacrifice that's offered, but also because having been the sacrifice, He now what? 
He is interceding for us. And then, and then one, one, the larger catechism, question 55, asks, but what does it mean that Jesus intercedes for us? What does His intercession consist of? So, how does Christ make intercession? This is a larger catechism, question 55. Christ maketh intercession by His appearing. Oh, gosh, this is so good. Man, these, David, those guys were good. Those Westminster divine guys, they, they knew a thing or two. Christ maketh intercession by His appearing in our nature continually before the Father in heaven. Just stop right there. Remember, please remember this. When Jesus became incarnate of the Virgin Mary, when God added humanity to His divinity, two natures in one person, when Jesus died and rose from the dead, He did not cease to be human. He is still 100% God and 100% human. He is one of us. He is our older brother. And, the, and, and what it means is that one, listen to this, one of us, a member of the human race, is our representative before the Father. He appears before the Father as one of us. Man, I, I could just, I just want to worship. Listen to this. In the merit of his obedience and sacrifice on earth, declaring his will to have it applied to all believers. Okay, the second phrase says, the merit of his two things, obedience and his sacrifice. As a, as a priest, he has his obedience and his sacrifice applied to believers. Now, if you ask most believers, they'll they say, does the sacrifice of Jesus apply to you? And they'll say, yeah, of course. But if you ask them, but does the merit of Jesus' obedience apply to you? See, see you're not just saved by Jesus' death. You're saved by Jesus' life. Now, bear with me a little theological stuff here. This is what's called the active and the passive obedience of, of Jesus. So, passive has to do with his suffering. And if I asked you, is the, is the passive obedience of Jesus, his suffering obedience, is that applied to you? You would say, well, well, yes, of course, that takes away my sin. But not only is Jesus' suffering, passive obedience applied to you, so is his what obedience? His active obedience. It's required of Jesus as a priest that what kind of life must he live? Perfect perfectly holy and listen to this that perfect life the merit of that perfect life is applied to you that is yours not just his death taking away your sin but jesus life of obedience that whole life that he lived is now counted as your life let that sink into you. So Jesus is before the Father, one of us, our representative, saying, Father, my perfect life and my sacrificial death all belongs to them. I'm here as their representative. That's intercession. Isn't that astonishing? He is your representative before the Father. He stands in your place. Now, there's a wonderful picture of this in Exodus 32 where God says to Moses, I'm going to kill everybody. So, you know how Israel was in the wilderness. They were well-behaved, a perfectly ordered people. Well, not so much. And God finally comes to Moses and he says, I've had it. I've had it with this bunch and I've decided to kill them all and start over with you. Now, if it had been me, I'd have said, Makes sense. Uh, seems like a good idea. You're right. They're a pain in the rear end, Lord. Let's, let's uh, start, because uh, me, I'm, yeah. come on. Been waiting for the attaboy there, Father. Thank you. Not Moses, not Moses. It's very interesting. Moses says, if you do that, people back in Egypt are going to say bad things about you, number one. 
And so you brought all those people out, but you couldn't get them all the way into the land. So uh, what kind of God is that? So that's number one, Lord. Number two, number two, if you're going to kill them, then you're going to have to kill me too. And then in your English versions, it'll have this. In your English versions, back there in Exodus, there's a dash. There's a dash. Because in the Hebrew text, there's a, there's a gap. Moses is, and what that gap is there is representing Moses going, your, it's your call. Because I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. So if you're going to kill them, you've got to kill me too. How many appreciate that with God? That's a, de- that's a degree of boldness that most of us probably don't, don't possess, all right? Because I'd be saying, okay, well, you've got to kill me too. I'd be thinking, well, you're probably going to, so, you know. So, 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 so Moses says, I'm the representative of these people. I'm representing them. I want you to know Christ, as your priest, is representing you before the Father. This is his intercessory ministry. And this is why, this is why you will make it to the end. This is why every aspect of who you are will be subdued to the gospel. This is why you're going to be conformed to the image of Christ. This is why nothing can separate you from the love of God. Because, get this, you may want to give up, but Jesus will never give up. He will never give you up. He will, when, if, if, if God were if God the Father were somehow to say, well, I'm just, Jesus like Moses would say, ah, no, I already died. I took care of it. I, I paid the penalty. You cannot, you cannot commit double jeopardy. You cannot charge them with a crime and an offense. You cannot hold them guilty for something I have already paid the penalty for. You can't apply the penalty twice. I took it. It's paid for. It's done. You're not an unjust God. And so he always lives to make intercession for us. So then it says, he has your, his life applied to you, all believers, answering all accusations against them and procuring for them quietness of conscience, notwithstanding their daily failings, access with boldness to the throne of grace and acceptance of their persons, and get this last phrase, and services. And services. How many of you um, know that when you serve in the church or you serve in the kingdom in some way, it's always imperfect? What makes it, and you go, but, but how many know God rewards it? He rewards it. He does. He rewards it. There's rewards for your service. And the a judgment day makes that clear that God rewards his people. What makes our service to God acceptable to God? Jesus' priestly ministry. He makes, he makes, he makes your, your work in the church something that God the Father receives and rewards because you're so good no but because jesus does what with it he mediates it he mediates it to the father so it comes through him so that by the way i hope you guys will will go look that up you can just do it online uh westminster larger catechism question 55 or you can (laughs) there you go there you go so, so this, this, no, that's, that's excellent. So, so it's vital that we are gripped by this amazing truth that Jesus is our Redeemer, our King, but don't ever forget that Jesus is your High Priest and He's interceding for you. That puts the rest of what happens here in John 17 in context. Okay, so we're at the golden lampstand. What is Jesus' chief concern in His praying? His chief concern is is the glory of the Father. So if we turn back to John 17, and we look at that, and we'll spend a few more minutes on this. In John 17, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you have given Him authority over all flesh, that to all those whom you have given Him, He may give eternal life. So Jesus begins with the subject of glory and returning to glory. Look, I'm going to come back to verses 2 and 3 in just a minute. But in verse 4, I'm scooting past them for just a second. I want to come back to them. But in verse 4, I glorified you on the earth. Okay, so Jesus says, I, have a, I had a glory with you before time began. I'm going to come back to it. 
in my ministry here on the earth, I glorified you. And I have accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Does anybody have, anybody have anything different than accomplished? In verse 4? Finished. Okay, is that, the, is that, that ought to ring a bell. Uh, that same word is going to show up in John 19. So here's, here's Jesus and He's interceding. He's saying, Father, see in John 19 He's going to hang on the cross and He's going to say what? It is finished. Here in John 17, Father, it is finished. Now in John 19, it is finished. The price has been paid. In John 17, it is finished. The life has been lived. That life of perfect obedience that is counted to you, it's, I've done it. I did it. I've finished. Now, here's how Paul puts it. I've finished the course. I've run the race, kept the faith, finished the course. Now there is laid up for me the crown, which the Lord will award to me, and not only to me, but to all those who are his and who love his appearing. So that's Paul in 2 Timothy. So Jesus has come, and he knows he's come to the end of his life. He knows he's about to go back to God. And I just want to say a pastoral word about here. Do you know when you get to die? And you can't die a minute before when your work is done. And whenever, whenever the Father takes you, you may or may not be aware of it, but your work is finished. And he won't take you a minute before that. Even in your dying, you're still working. You're still serving. That's why when Christians are dying, they are still ministering to God. Christians who are suffering going towards death are offering their service to God just as Jesus did. They're bearing witness to the sufferings of Jesus. They're bearing witness to the brokenness of the world. They're bearing witness to the brokenness that's in the Father's heart for people who are in pain. And their pain. Uh, um, you can't leave until your work is finished. So you kind of go, well, why, is this person, why is this person still here? Because their work isn't done. And when their work is done, they can go. So Jesus says to the Father, I just make that pastoral point. Because, you know, just so you know. Because if you go, why is that person, why did that person leave so early? Or why is that person staying so long? Right? They left early, in, as we count early, because what? They were fin it's finished. Their, their, their work is done. And this person's staying for a long time? Why? Why are, why are they, and they seem, and they're suffering so. Why are they, you know, well, they're, they're bearing witness in their suffering to the sufferings of Jesus. They're ministering to God in their suffering. And so Jesus comes to the end of his life, and he says to the Father, it's finished now. And what, what, what happens when things are finished, when it's wrapped up? Where does he go? Where's he saying? What's he saying? Father, do what? Take me back. Take me back. So what words on the cross resemble that? So it is finished, but then right after he says, it is finished, he then says, Father, this is in John 19, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last. So he goes back to the Father. That's a Christian death. Okay, that's Christian death. That's Christian living and dying. We live, and that's why Paul says whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. And to live is Christ, this is Philippians 1, whether we live or, or we die, we're the Lord's, is Romans 14. But Philippians 1, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Gain. All right. So, I'm going to go back to the Father. Glory is Jesus' chief concern. He is going to return to glory. He has finished. The entire scope of Jesus' life and ministry is summed up in this word, which is then carried to the cross. It is finished. Now, let me cover just one more thing with you tonight. And it's in verses 2 and 3. And it's an amazing truth. <clears throat> Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's important for you to see here in this verse that when Jesus talks to the Father about his people, he refers to them this way, Father, you gave me authority over all mankind. There's never been a moment where Jesus didn't possess authority over all things. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world, and all those who dwell therein. Psalm 24, 1. There's never been a moment 
where Jesus did not have total, absolute authority over all things. In Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So go and make disciples. So Jesus has authority over all things. He's always been King of kings and Lord of lords. Then he says, yeah, I have authority over everything. That to all, Father, whom you have given me, I, can, I give the gift of eternal life. I want you to watch the progression. Jesus has authority over all things. With authority over all things, Jesus receives from the Father certain people as his inheritance. The, those whom you have given me. And we've already looked at this in John 6 and in John 10. Those of you who have been in this study, you know this language. You should know this language by now. It's John 6 and John 10 language. Those whom you have given me. The gift the Father makes. I hope this astonishes you tonight. I hope it astonishes you that God, before time began, turned to His Son and He said, I am, Son, I am giving you as your inheritance Joabi and Amy. I'm give, son, I'm giving you Mary. When you think for a second that God the Father gave you as a gift to his son, that should blow your mind. And that happened before time ever began. Not just before you were born, before time began. Father, those whom you have given me, then what does Jesus say? To those whom you have given me, I have given what? eternal life. Now see, a lot of evangelicals think that if you get the gift of eternal life, then you belong to Jesus. Actually, you get the gift of eternal life because you, you have been given to Jesus. You don't give your life to Jesus. I hate to break it to you. You'll go, I mean, it's good common evangelical. When did you give your life to Jesus? You never did. I know what you mean by that language, but here's the truth. God gave your life to Jesus. God the Father gave your life to Jesus as his inheritance. You know, that's really wild language, inheritance language. It's actually all over the Bible. So John 17, <clears throat> look at verse 6. I have manifested to your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me. Verse 9, I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me. Verse 11, I am no longer in the world, yet they themselves are in the world. I'm coming to you, Father. Keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. I guarded them. Not one of them has perished but the son of perdition, so that the Scripture would be fulfilled. We'll pick that up next time. Verse 20, this prayer embraces all disciples. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, those, those apostles there, but for all those who believe in me through their word. That would be us. Because we believe through the apostolic witness that is born to Jesus. Now, this language of inheritance shows up in Psalms, in uh, Deuteronomy, but in Psalm um, 78, 71, and 79, verse 1, you can look it up later, it talks about how Israel is God's inheritance, is God's inheritance, the heritage of the Lord. Now, in Ephesians 1, verse 18, we should go over to Ephesians, we'll, we'll go over there because I want you to see the inheritance language there. Um, let's uh, turn over a few pages there, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians 1, verse 18. Here's, a, here's Paul at prayer. And Paul's praying, verse 18, that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling and what are the riches of the glory of... And I want you to finish the verse. His inheritance in the saints. It does not say the riches of the saints inheritance in Christ. It says what? The riches of the glory of his inheritance where? In the saints. Paul's praying that their eyes will be open to see who they are. 
you are Jesus' inheritance. Now, Ephesians does talk about you having an inheritance. Okay, you shouldn't miss that. All right, we have an inheritance. Verse 14 of Ephesians 1, Christ, or the Spirit rather, is given as a pledge of our inheritance. So we do have an inheritance. And that's talked about in chapter 5, verse 5 as well. Ephesians 5, verse 5. This you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So in Ephesians, we have an inheritance, but we also, don't miss this, we also are an inheritance. So how is it that you have come to have eternal life? How is it that you have come to have eternal life now in history at this point in your life? Before time ever began, God the Father gave you to His Son as His inheritance. You are a gift to His Son. And the Son turned to the Father and said, I receive them. They're my bride, and I will shed my blood and die for them and love them to the end. I'll wash their feet. I will cleanse them. I will heal their wounds. I will purify them. I will make them mine. You are, from before time began, the inheritance that the Father gave the Son. And the Son came and won that with His blood. And He keeps it by His continuing intercession for you. So that you not only are an inheritance, but then because He's interceding for you, in the end you will what? Have an inheritance that's in the kingdom of God. You will have an inheritance. So you are an inheritance and you have an inheritance. And what He gives you between eternity past, when the Father gave you to Him, and eternity future, when we receive the inheritance, what He gives you between those two poles of eternity, so to speak, is the gift of eternal life. Don't miss this. Eternal life, the phrase eternal life, is not the same thing as everlasting life. Okay? Everlasting life, everlasting is a time word. That means life what? Without end. Now they're, they're close, they're very close, but eternal life is different. Eternal life, see, see, in a certain sense, when does everlasting life begin? Life in, with the, in the absence of all death. When does that happen? Well, that happens at the end of history with the resurrection. But how many of you have eternal life right now? Eternal life. You do. You have eternal life right now. Because listen to how Jesus defines eternal life. Eternal life is not an extension of time or anything to do with time. It's a relationship. That to all those whom thou hast given me, I may give to them eternal life. And this is eternal life. John 17, verse 3. It's right there in your text. John 17, verse 3. And this is eternal life that they may know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So what is eternal life? Eternal life is a relationship with God. So I'd put it to you this way. How many of you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? You, you know what that is? What, the, what does the Bible call that? that call, the Bible calls that eternal life. Eternal life is something you have right now. And it's on that basis that you will enter into everlasting life, which is immortality okay so a relationship with god is what you have right now and that is so that's why he says eternal life is knowing god a relationship with god the word that he uses there gnosko is the greek equivalent of a hebrew word and we've, we've gone over this before it's kind of fun it's an old hebrew word it still occurs in yiddish to this day it's from the book of genesis and it's the word you remember it yada yada and some of you learned it watching Seinfeld, right? You know, Joe met Sally and yada, yada, yada. Okay, and that meant what? They were, in a, they were in a relationship. They were in a relationship. And it's used in Genesis that way. It says, and Adam knew Eve, which is a very polite King James Version of saying what? Well, they had intercourse, all right? They had a sexual union. It means that they were intimately joined together. The two became one. It's a relational word. It's a relational word. So in John 17, 3, Jesus says, 
this is eternal life, that they may know God, that you and I might become one with God in a relationship with Him. We are now united to God. Eternal life is something we have now, and that will give us life to come. So let me put it to you this way. How many of you have been raised from the dead? You say, well, Pastor, it kind of depends on what you mean. Exactly. How many of you have been crucified with Christ? Yes. And buried with Him? Yes. And raised with Him? All right. When, 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 when did that happen? Well, when you were baptized. That's what Paul says in Romans 6. And by baptism, we're, we're buried with Him and, and, and raised with Him. So if I ask you again, you who are dead in your trespasses and sins. Remember, Paul uses this language in Ephesians 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God has made you alive. So how many of you were raised from the dead? Okay. But how many of you have been raised from the dead? Bodily raised from the dead. Have you had that? No, because every day you get up and you look in the mirror and you go, bah. not looking very glorious, not looking very resurrected, moving closer towards it, but, <laughs> all right, so, so we wait, Paul says in, in, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, we wait for our glorified bodies. He said we will be given bodies that are like Jesus' glorified body. It's Ephesians, uh, Philippians 3, 20. Bodies that are in conformity to his glorified body. That's going to be our inheritance. Uh, it's all over Romans 8 as well. So Romans 8, Philippians 3, uh, lots of places. So glorified bodies. So why are you going to be raised from the dead bodily? Because you've already been raised from the dead, how? Spiritually. You're going to have everlasting life, immortality, bodily, because right now in your spirit you have what? Eternal life, which is a relationship with God right now. You are one with God through Jesus Christ. Christianity is not a list of do's and don'ts. Christianity is not a philosophy. Christianity, true Christianity, is a relationship with God knowing God through Jesus Christ who gave his life for you and ever lives to intercede for you. Amen? Well, we'll stop there. We've got a couple minutes for comments or questions or anything like that. Uh, yeah, Taylor. <laughs> yes. In the third person, yeah. Well, scholars um, on this particular text um, think that it could be uh, uh, like an editorial insertion. He either used those words like, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent, right? Um, or it could be language that he's using to self-identify, you know, because in John's gospel, Jesus is, uses ego amy, I am, all the time. I am the way. And I am the door, I am the good shepherd. It's, it's in a certain sense, if you take this in the right way, uh, um, concentrated in his person. So it's not unusual. And it would be really, really out of character in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But in John's gospel, part of the emphasis is Jesus stepping forward into the center of all things and saying, this is who I am. And so it's not out of character with John's gospel at all. Though some commentators you can look at say, well, this is an editorial insertion that was made by the writer of the gospel saying that they would know God and Jesus whom he sent, kind of like a preacher, you know, saying, you know, that, like that. That's a possible, that's possible, you know, I'm going to not say that that's not a credible argument, and it doesn't change it either way. It's still the inspired text, but yeah, good catch on that. John? Yeah. Hmm. There was, you know, I mean, there was a, there's a notion of uh, the people will never be without a priestly representative. Yeah. I'm just I'm curious if there was ever a time that, that, that people did not have a, a priest that, that interceded for them or, or something like that. I'm not, I'm not aware of any ancient civilizations that didn't practice a form of priesthood. I'm not aware of any. It's an echo of God's general revelation. Um, so you find it everywhere. I'm not aware, that, I'm not saying there weren't any, but here was a significant difference, and the, and, and the Hebrew 7 text is mentioning this, and it's comparing him to Melchizedek, 
who was a king priest. So, so often, the king also represented the people. He was the priestly representative too. So the two offices were united in the one person. In Israel, the offices were separated. Uh, priestly service and royal kingly service were separated and then reunited back in Jesus, who is both king and priest as well as prophet. So um, I'm not aware of any ancient civilization. Somebody else may be able to help on that, may know a lot more about it than me. Yeah, yeah. there was an overlap there. So what, what, but here's the point he's making too, and he makes a furnishings point. He makes a point about furniture. And when he says, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for all time, sat down. And, and what he's referring to there is the fact that in the Mosaic tabernacle and the Solomonic temple, there, there's no seating because the priests offer their stuff continually. They're always on the move. But Jesus does it and then does what? Because it is finished. So he sits. And so he is a seated priest. He's an enthroned priest. It's a, t- it's a completely different kind of priesthood. It's a fulfillment priesthood. And so, and so there's, there's that overlap. There's a 40-year there's a gap, or a 40-year overlap, rather, between Jesus entering his priesthood. That's why the veil is torn, right? And the temple ultimately comes down. Other, other questions? Yeah, sorry, Taylor. They have rabbis. They don't have priests. And the reason they don't have priests, though there are people that would, would say there's no temple, there's, you can only offer a sacrifice in the temple. So the rabbis are a post-temple um, uh, approach to how the faith works. And they arose in a post-exilic Israel as well when there was no temple. Um, rabbinic Judaism grows in Babylon. It's Babylonian. Uh, because there was no temple, so how do we practice our faith? How do we keep the faith in a foreign land? We've hung our harps in the willow trees uh, by the rivers of Babylon. We don't have a temple. We can't do our sacrifices. How do we teach our children? How do we keep covenant in this strange land until God takes us home? Yeah, rabbinic, the, that, well, that's right. The rabbinic office is an office of teaching. So when Jesus is teaching... That's why he's referred to in the New Testament as rabbi. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there are people who are trying, I guess, to... Yeah, that, that would make Jurassic Park look old school, so wouldn't it? So, uh, anyway. Well... Thanks, everybody. The Lord's blessing be upon you. Go in grace. Amen.